we got? Judge, as you know, um, the state was made aware of some newly discovered evidence last week. Um, the state informed the defense as quickly as possible of this evidence. We also informed the court of the evidence and um, the state is now moving to admit that evidence for trial um, for the jury to hear by way of Captain Hands and Mark Jane Barton as witnesses. Um, Captain Hands was already under subpoena. Uh, we have now confirmed that Ms. Barton is under a uh, lawful out-of-state subpoena. She's in Tennessee. Um, and at this point, we can call a witness if you would like to hear more foundation. All right, go ahead. Captain Lee Hands. State calls Captain Lee Hands. Yeah, um, Your Honor, Captain Hands took a recording of Miss Barton when she called into CID. And at the, towards the end of the recording, it's about a 14 minute recording, from 1210 to 1230, uh, Martha Barton gives her phone number. And um, we have been made aware by several witnesses um, that we have unintentionally put their phone numbers on the record and so forth. Um, I think maybe the defense did to Mr. Ferris and then Addison Ferris and so on. So at this point, um, we would ask to redact that portion of the recording. It is 20 seconds, just her phone number. Uh, yeah, we probably have done some things in the trial with it being broadcast that we probably should have thought about, but we haven't dealt with that for four years. So. <coughs> Exactly, right. Judge. Captain, if you could please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in the matter now pending before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I swear. How are you employed, Captain? I am uh, with the Cherokee Sheriff's Office. I am the Division Commander for the Criminal Investigations Division. And can you actually state and spell your name for the record? H-A-N-D-S, just like the end of your arms. Captain, um, were you on duty last week? Yes. Are you under subpoena for this case? I am. And you were called out to, uh, you were actually on scene in 2018 at Purcell Lane for this case. Is that true? I was. Okay. On Friday, October 18th, this past Friday, um, did you take a call at CID that you had to make our prosecution team aware of? I did. Okay, can you tell the court about that call? It was uh, slightly before 10 o'clock. My administrative assistant said that there was a Martha Barton on the phone and she wanted to talk to someone that had knowledge of the case currently being prosecuted, the Melody Farris case. So who ended up taking that call? I did. Why, why you? I believe I was the only one in the building at the time that had knowledge of the case. And so did you end up speaking with Mark Barton? I did. Did you record that phone call with her? I did. And have you had an opportunity to listen to that recording? I have. Did you forward that recording to myself, me? I did. Um, and did you then inform me about who it was that just called and why you were sending me a recording? I did. And at this time, the state would like to publish um, admit and publish M. Barton 1. All right. For the purpose of this hearing. For the purpose least. of this hearing. All right. Have y'all gotten a copy of it yet? We have. Okay. It's 14.09, Judge. Okay. It's Captain Hands can help you. Who am I speaking to? Captain Hands. H A N D. S. This is Martha Barton in Tullahoma, Tennessee. How are you, ma'am? Have you skipped the phone number? Well, I've got a heavy heart. Okay. Oh, uh, 
you, I'm sure you're very aware of the case of Melody Parish that's going on right now. I am. I've seen it on court TV. Mm -hmm. I'm the person that she was coming to stay with in Tennessee mm -hmm. and did her mother and I were first cousins. I think her I remember mother was your name. My, pardon? I think I remember your name coming up. Well, it's been brought up in the trial, too. Yeah. Well, Detective uh, Polk and Hayes came to my house along uh, earlier the TBI came. They never asked me if we had any guns. Mm -hmm. Rusty Martin, that testified yesterday and day before, is my stepson. My husband died 10 years ago. And, but he and I have had a close relation. He's been very good to me, offering to do things for me. And uh, he's the one that had a relationship with Melody. Yes, ma'am. But they never asked me if we had any guns. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very strange because my husband was a hunter and we had a very large gun, gun safe in the garage because, but of course they were never out. This may be long. Mm -hmm. I hope I don't go around the bush to tell this. But anyway, I think in 1979, we built in 78, I think it was in 1979 for Christmas that year. My husband gave me a 38 snub nose special. I never shot the gun. I never, Roy went hunting. I never paid any attention to his guns. In fact, when we married, I was absolutely terrified of guns. And I, I guess I got over that a little bit, but never to the point of of handling them and doing anything. When he gave me that gun, he gave me a hundred dollar bill rolled up and put in the cartridges. Mm -hmm. And he made a joke and Rusty was here. It was at our family Christmas and he gave it to me said if he hadn't given me the hundred dollar bills, he'd have never gotten away with giving me a gun. It was put in a drawer, different places. I never, I couldn't, I even bought him a 357 Magnum. I couldn't tell you for Christmas one year. I couldn't tell you what that gun looked like and it's in our safe. Uh, I couldn't tell you if it's chrome. Well, I couldn't. I'm sorry. I just don't know. Okay. And if it were a purse or shoe, I could tell you. <laughs> but anyway, the 357 Magnum, my husband was sick and at home when Melody came up to help us take me to Nashville to doctor's appointments. And at that time, Roy had gotten sick. Before that, because he had a stroke and he had Parkinson's. You talk about Roy, Before your husband, he, not Rusty, right? Right. Okay. Before that, he had kept his 357 Magnum in his closet on his side of the bed I mean, in, on, yeah, his closet's on his side of the room. And uh, he had get, gotten mine out to, for me to keep on my side for protection. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe the shells, they were never loaded. And I think the shells to my gun were... I don't know if they were in my closet or not, but my gun eventually mm -hmm. 
ended up underneath my nightstand because I just didn't like having it in my closet. Okay. And my closet is about like Deborah McGee's closet anyway. <laughs> and uh, so sometime after he passed away, Bellady wasn't here at the time. I took, and I don't know why, I did not put those in the gun safe, but I didn't. There was a, in one of the spare bedrooms upstairs, there is a chest at the foot of the bed when it's against the wall. And I put those two guns in there. There, I put a TV on top of it, and I don't even know what all, but I had stuff piled up on that that I thought nobody is going to move all that stuff to get in that chest. I was very weak one day when she was here, and I told her for several things were that I shouldn't have, but she had a way of, well, she was family. And I told her where those two guns were. Well, after she was arrested, I had someone come out and take a lot of things that I had gone through and stored mm -hmm. in this particular bedroom, just in the floor and everything. Mm -hmm. And I wanted that TV take all this stuff taken to Goodwill. And while he was here, I said, would you do it in that chest and see about those two guns? And he did. The 357 Magnum was there. My 38 Special was gone. I have also searched this house over to see. I mean, I know I'm not senile. I'm in very poor health, mm -hmm. but that gun is gone. It was brought up in Rusty's testimony day before yesterday that his daddy has a 357 Magnum, and I, I almost believe that he said that I had the 38 because. I was watching it, and the one that I was watching it on was the court TV, and there was a man down in the corner that would make comments, and he had the earphones on and everything. And when that was said, he said, that's where she got the gun. And I think that he would come, I think he called my name. My heart, I have felt so guilty ever since I realized my gun was gone. And then when it came up in court, I think that you all can go back and listen to that and realize that there is another gun. And another thing, it was in a little uh, leather holster. And Scott found that gun and I, she took that from my house. I was in the hospital three times, I know, from the time my husband died. I had heart surgery. And then I was in the hospital here in Tullahoma. I'm pretty sure it was three times. I know two times that my blood pressure dropped. And she was here, and she had access, and Rusty, mentions in his testimony. Okay, I can't talk that, about the testimony though because I'm under subpoena. Okay, well, if you all can go back and listen to it, can you do that? Okay. Now, was your gun in a holster? Yes, it was in a holster. Okay, a leather holster? I guess or? that's one reason that I don't even remember if it was dark, chrome, whatever. Who is who? I'll check. Okay, go ahead. I'm so sorry, Miss Barton. 
Who who was the guy that came over that you told to look for the guns after the arrest? It was my nephew. Okay. But I really don't want him involved. I I, I understand. <laughs> I am going to, um, but and you've checked other places for the gun since. Is that correct? I have looked this house over. This gun, that gun is not here. And uh, there were some other things that I told her that disappeared when she was here too that she is the only person she was the only person in this house so i don't have a family i've got a niece and nephew and we were split up over melody too it just about broke our family apart her coming up here and I think they were in contact with uh, Chris and Scott and knew about Rusty. Honest to, I did not know that was going on. It made me sick to listen to the testimony. I'm just, I don't even feel like I can go out of my house. I don't get up that much anyway. But hold my head up and tell Homer, because I don't know who knows this. I am so embarrassed. Well, there's nothing that you did, so, I mean, there's no reason for you to be embarrassed. I know, I know, but it's the Martin name. It's, oh, I'm embarrassed. Well, I'm embarrassed that I have to tell you this. Well, what's your phone? I didn't sleep all. What's your phone number? 12 30. Okay. 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 Would that I'll be okay be with you? Yes. Well, I'll be here. I'm sorry for your heavy heart, but I do appreciate you giving us a call. Well, I just felt like by not telling this that I was almost aiding and abetting, and I know. From the get-go, she started throwing Scott under the bus. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine a mother doing, I'm not a mother, but I cannot imagine a mother doing that. Did she ever say and, anything uh, untoward about her husband? Pardon? Did she ever say anything untoward about her husband? Oh, she despised him. All right. Well, I'm going to send your number and your information over. Um, I am again. I'm, I'm. I wish you would feel good about walking around your 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 hometown. You didn't do anything untoward or or unethical, and you can't help the actions of other people. Well, I know that, but I'm 84 years old, and I don't need to be going through this. No. Well, hope it'll be over very shortly, and. Uh, We'll take it one step at a time, okay? Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much, ma'am. Thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Captain, was that your um, complete conversation with Miss Barton? Yes, ma'am. Did you speak with her again after that phone call? No, ma'am. That's all I have for you. Thank you. All right. Sweetie. Just briefly. How did this phone call get directed to you? My administrative assistant came to my office and said there's a Martha Barton on the phone that wants to speak with somebody that knows something about the case. Okay. Uh, and that would be, you would know something about the case because back on July the 5th, 2018, you were actually in charge of this investigation, the entirety of the investigation. Well, I would say the captain was in charge of the investigation and then the lieutenant was in charge of the investigation, but I was in charge of parts of it, yes. Okay. And you assigned... Oh, I'm sorry. Got it, sir. I apologize. Well, there's been multiple witnesses testify that you gave them assignments in the case. Surely. Him included. Surely. So you assigned him as the lead detective of this case. Correct. Correct. Uh, so what involvement have you had in this case ever since? Since when? Since July 5th? 2018. Until we would do periodic hot washes, reviews of what we were doing, where things were going, what evidence was coming in, and since 2018 after the arrest warrants were complete then it was 
pretty much just Detective Hayes, or now Sergeant Hayes, finishing his narrative and keeping in touch with the prosecutor's office. You, you used a term of art that I'm not familiar with. Hot you office. said hot watch? Hot wash. Hot wash. What is that? It's basically a debrief, seeing where you are evidence-wise, investigative-wise. Okay. Anything else from this witness? Michael. That's all, Judge. All right. Anything else? No, Judge. All right. You step down. Thanks, sir. Uh, have y'all had other conversations with her? Or so, yes, Judge, okay. our office um, did reach out to her. Investigator Moore spoke with her. She she put together a report um, of a summary of their conversation, which we provided to the defense last week as well. Um, and that was on the same day, same Friday, at... <laughs> Thank you. Yes, 7.36 p.m. Um, Investigator Moore had sent her supplemental report regarding her conversation with Martha Barton. Um, All right, now I've got a copy of that. We did. Yeah, was any, any additional information disclosed in that? So additionally, she kind of, uh, Ms. Barton provided a timeline and stated that her, uh, when her nephew came to help her, she realized it went missing around that time, which was in September of 2019, shortly after the defendant was arrested. Um, she also, she ended up telling her cousin, who is the defendant's mom, Kay Walker, about the missing firearm. Uh, she did not necessarily give a estimate of when she did that, but she stated that she ended up telling her about the missing gun. Um, she provided that when Martha would call, would speak with Melody in the jail, um, she would say I love you to Martha Jane at the end of the call, and then shortly after telling her mother about the, telling Kay Walker, about telling Melody's mother, Kay Walker, about the gun, she stopped telling Martha I love you. She never confronted Melody about the missing gun. I think that was summarily the new information that we obtained. Right. And y'all have subpoenaed, effectuated services subpoena at this time. Is that right? Judge, I'm sorry. Can I have one second? Um, or... We have some more information to we, All right. we, we, uh, we spoke with her again today, this morning, our, and I say we, Investigator Moore, spoke with her again this morning, so she's going to put together a report for that. But also, do y'all want to just put her on the stand there? All right. Oh, yeah, Investigator yeah. Moore? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right. 